ContraSense is a podcast that brings you new research from the social sciences. This time you are listening to Maria and Marina. And our guest today is Cornel Bunn. He is an associate professor of international political economy at the Copenhagen Business School. He has written on the politics of economic expertise, policy shifts in international financial institutions, and the politics of capitalist diversity in Brazil, Spain, Hungary, and Romania. He is also a researcher on the project Prep Work, Precarious Work and Peripheral Housing, which we are talking about in this episode and the two previous episodes uh, from this playlist. Today we have Cornel Bahn as a guest in our in our podcast Contrasense. Uh, welcome to to this discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, I we were thinking just before we talk about maybe more specific things regarding your research. Can you tell our listeners in general what it is that you like to do uh, and research? What drives you to study political economy and why is it important? Hmm, that's a good question. I, uh, you know, political economy is a subfield of, of political science, yeah, um, today. But it used to be what we call economics. I mean, uh, there was no such thing as economics. It was always called political economy 200 years ago, yeah. Um, and the idea is that the predecessors of economics knew that what happens in, say, the supply or the demand side of a market economy is shaped by political decisions. Yeah, I mean, if you take, uh, I don't know, the beginnings of industrialization, uh, the British state uh, had a very important role in that industrialization without the British state promoting legislation that essentially uh, forced a lot of peasants to become industrial workers. There would not have been enough industrial workers to have an industrial economy. So. Um, likewise, if you think of what's happening today in international trade, the United States now um, has decided that um, that whenever they decide to uh, spend money on changing their energy sector yeah, and have more renewables, they decide that China should not be allowed to do that. That's a political decision. It's not a market decision. So political economy, in other words, takes... Um, the economy more seriously, right? It it admits that there are um, uh, state policies, there are um, uh, business interests, there are labor interests, there are um, essentially a professional interests that, that shape what's happening. And it's not some kind of idealized uh, market model in which uh, business decisions is all that there is uh, in the market. So this is what I do. And, and I'm not a particularly good scholar um, who defends his brand. So I don't have one brand, um, uh, which is pretty bad for me professionally. I mean, in, in the sense that people just take one thing and they go with that over decades and they're known for something. So I've done I've done a lot of work on neoliberalism as a, uh, as a political economic project and about the economists and the technocrats that push for it. Then I, I looked at... Um, a completely different agenda, and most of my time is actually spent on and on how the financial markets are organized and are are um, politically uh, governed. Yeah, uh, but then um, I have about five or six topics. I will not bore you with them. But one of them that has been consistent was to look at my own country, where I come from, in comparative perspective, and find out exactly what shapes its economic um, uh, status quo. Like what? Why does Romania look the way it does in 2023? And it used to be that I spent a lot more time than I spend now. So my previous book, 2014, was about what, you know, why is it that Romania looks the way it does in 1960, 1990? It's very historical, right? So this is what I do. Uh, I'm interested essentially in how uh, states and societies can change the economy. I think that's the fundamental thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I I find it very interesting um, that even though you outside of Romania since some years already, you found it uh, important and relevant to look at the at the Romania and uh, its economical situation. And I wanted to ask you maybe just just as a as a short uh, a teaser for for the people listening uh, the the episode. 
Mm, how how do you reflect on this? If uh, you why did you decide to do that? Because there was no one in Romania doing it, or because you said okay, have this perspective from the outside. What motivated you? Because I I also sometimes think about about Romania, even though I'm not there, and I'm asking myself if I'm if I'm in the right position, for example, to to go and say yeah. something or no, you know this. It's a good question. I mean, there is both a personal and a, an intellectual interest. It's a personal interest because I'm very connected with my family and the place where I'm from. Um, I'm from uh, a village close to Bistrița in North Transylvania. Uh, I go there several times a year. Um, I'm very close to my parents. Uh, and, and you know, that makes me I try to understand why do I see the changes that I see? And uh, from the very beginning, when I emigrated in 2000 and 2001, I left for the US to do my PhD. Um, um, you know, there was this personal interest in in trying to use my um, my scholarly um, capital to basically try to understand what happened to me and my parents and my neighbors and my uncles and aunts. Yeah, um, and the second interest is is intellectual. It is related, however, right in the sense that what I was taught in university in the states did not neatly fit uh, what I was seeing back at home. Uh, or some of the things that I um, read through a Romanian set of lenses, the lenses of somebody who was very liberal in the 90s, like most, I think, Romanian students were at the time, did not fit the um, what I was reading about uh, transformations in the market economy that I read about in the US, right? So I, I was exposed to a very different... Um, much more diverse, not to one school of thought, but much more diverse school of thought. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there's a very, I think this is a, the third level, a very practical uh, set of considerations. At the end of the way, it's the country I know best, right? I mean, I have I have access, I can meet people uh, at various levels of decision-making power, and they can provide me with, you know, pretty good uh, reflection of what constitutes insider uh, perspectives. Um, it's very hard. I could say Spain is the other country that uh, I work on intensely, and I wrote, I wrote a book that compares Romania and Spain um, in terms of how they evolved uh, as members of the EU. Uh, and I have pretty good contacts in Spain, but I couldn't say that about the other countries that I work on, like say Denmark or, or Brazil, or um, this day I, I work a lot on Hungary. Um, you know the language, the finesse, the humor. I mean, these are these are all forms of capital that it would be stupid to uh, to not use. And so, I would say that there are practical, intellectual, and personal reasons to um, uh, to study Romania. Plus, it's it's you're right. I mean, it's a very understudied case. Uh, there is now we have a lot of literature on uh, Romanian political economy, but back when I was writing, there was very little, and um, there was much more high quality analysis done during communism by western scholars working on romania then there it was done in the 90s and 2000s there was a lot of like really shallow analysis and quite ideological in in liberal terms uh, at the time so that was a good motivator to step into that gap now i think the situation has changed a lot and we have we have a lot of good stuff i was thinking that um for me also um in the last years but especially after after leaving the, the the faculty, I think I started realizing how interesting as a place uh, Eastern Europe is it, and it can be to understand and to try to uh, just grasp what is happening here. Um, and so you, I wanted to to go towards your research in that sense, and uh, you talk about very complex things. So let's just take them one by one. So there's uh, what we're seeing, a rise of nationalism and populism in some Eastern and Central European countries. So maybe if you could explain what that means. I mean, look, um, I think we should be careful the term nationalism and with, with it being associated with Eastern Europe. Um, economic nationalism is an empty signifier. It's an empty term. It can be used for anything. I'll give you an example. I mean, most people, when they say economic nationalism, they kind of assume that a government adopts economic policies that uh, that um, 
defend the national economy against competition with foreign economies. So it's a kind of protectionism. Um, you know, there is, of course, a version of economic nationalism that does that. But there's another one. If you think of the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, or I or Iceland in the in the 90s, I mean, they used economic nationalism to do the opposite, to do the most uh, sometimes the most experimental neoliberal reforms. And the idea was they wanted to be as different from Russia as possible. And Russia was associated with uh, a kind of big government interventionist statist policy, which was actually not true in the 90s. They had gone in the other direction. But nevertheless, in the public uh, memory of the Baltic countries, as this kind of like, you know, former uh, republics of the Soviet Union, um, it made no sense for the state to do anything. Yeah. Um, so nationalism there was used to actually promote economic liberalism, not the opposite. So I think the term nationalism can be uh, deployed in completely, you know, it can be deployed to adopt, um, um, you know, very progressive policies or very liberal policies or very conservative policies, right? Which is why uh, I think it's important to understand that economic nationalism in a globalizing world is just a platform. It's not doesn't have any nature in itself. I think what most people refer to economic nationalism is actually what we call uh, mercantilism, and it refers to, you know, defending the interests of some kind of domestic um, growth coalition, be them just business interests or a combination of business interests and labor interests. Yeah, uh, typically, I'll give you an example. Right, um, in um, in Germany, there is an uh, alliance between the owners of the car industry and uh, labor unions th that depend on the car industry. The labor unions get very high wages in the car sector. And um, and so Germany promotes what? It promotes a certain macroeconomic policy that favors this particular sector in being uh, the world's second largest exporting economy after China. Um, so in that sense, you know, is that a form of nationalism? It isn't really, right? But it it is a form of mercantilism, yeah, that kind of promotes a certain sector, yeah, in a certain growth coalition, and tailors not just Germany's policies but Europe's policies around that. And you know, East European countries are part of this German export machine. So when Germany does bad, we do badly as well. Um, so nationalism, therefore, uh, should be very carefully defined, and that's why. In my research, I argue that you can have national neoliberalism, meaning you can promote the general openness um, and uh, financial market credibility and um, and such that neoliberalism entails, and the usual playbook of neoliberal, um, which means basically superiority. Market is the most superior form of organization. Uh, market plus private property, um, and that basically the 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 is to maximize that particular uh, political program. That's neoliberalism. Um, but at the same time, and we see this in the case of Hungary uh, in particular, also in Romania, I mean, if we are actually pretty sober about it, the idea is that you can no longer deny globalization or European integration. I mean, you are part of this international system that you benefit from. Hungary and Romania benefit immensely from having access to a global market. Uh, via German capital. They don't have access directly, right? We we produce components for mostly German firms in manufacturing sector, or IT produces for various, essentially a global nebula of firms, but mostly, mostly European and American. And then they in turn are part of what we call global value chains, right? And then they export the final thing. So we benefit on that. If tomorrow the world would turn protectionist, Right. I mean, we would be completely uh, uh, wiped out. I mean, we would we don't have an, enough of a domestic market to support the current incomes. Right. So uh, people like Orban know this. Right. They know they cannot go uh, in a game of chicken against uh, against European integration or globalization and put up tariffs and just protect Hungarian ethnic Hungarian capital. They cannot do that. Right. Because that would mean destroying the state. It means destroying society, destroying labor, destroying. It's just too interconnected. Um, and so, nationalism under these conditions, yeah, means finding very creative ways to defend, say, Hungarian uh, mortgage owners, right? Make sure that their interest rate is low, and make sure that if they have foreign, um, 
exchange foreign currency mortgages yeah they are redenominated in foreign uh, at a rate that's favorable to them make sure that hungarian capital that supports the government gets uh, lucrative contracts on eu infrastructure funds make sure that the smes in hungary get a very competitive interest rate from the central bank i mean these are all things you can do under globalization i mean you can uh, you can pull it off if you if you're smart about it and Hungary has been pretty good at doing this until recently. We can talk about that later on. So you can practice this national neoliberalism in creative ways. You know, Denmark has um, one of my colleagues to whom I present this paper said, you know, uh, Denmark is not all that different. I mean, you make it sound like Eastern Europe is a special case. I mean, Denmark has a pretty clear um, policy to favor domestic interests over foreign interests. I'll give you one example, right? You cannot buy, not anybody can buy uh, real estate in Denmark. You need special, if you're a foreigner, you need approval from the Ministry of Finance to buy an apartment in Copenhagen. Unless, so unless you have a business or a labor contract in Denmark, you cannot buy. Yeah. Now, there are ways around it for very large institutional investors, right? But if you're a middle investor from Cruz, who has money from, has made money from IT and you want to buy an apartment worth a million in Copenhagen with the hope that it's going to be worth a million and a half in 10 years. They will not give it to you, right? Because they want to make sure that domestic mortgage owners are not priced out, right? And that uh, you don't become London, where you you know local people can't afford it. Also, uh, the Danish state is very very careful that a lot of um, of the research money goes to Danish firms, so that these Danish firms are then very competitive internationally, because otherwise they will not be able to pay very high wages to Danish uh, residents, right? So. Uh, there are degrees of national neoliberalism. Now, in in in, um, uh, of course, we have a social democratic welfare state here. It's unlike in Hungary. I mean, Hungary is just the kind of most spectacular case. I mean, the, what is the U.S. today? I mean, U.S. is no longer neoliberal. I mean, they just have the moment you put up protectionist barriers, which they do against what you consider a strategic competitor. One of the basic uh, criteria of neoliberalism, which is global openness, no longer applies. Right, so we are in a crisis now. Uh, we live in a sort of zombie neoliberalism now. We don't know where is where is is going to morph into. We'll probably have pretty some kind of measures of neoliberalism that could be more repressive. Like in Hungary, we have sort of protections against foreign interests. You have nationalization of foreign banks. You have special taxes on foreign businesses. But then you also have a very punitive environment for workers to the slave law, right? Which basically enables. Um, employers to make you work long long hours and pay you down the line whenever right so it's um it doesn't mean national liberalism doesn't mean that uh, people who live off of their wages are doing better some people who live off of their wages are, will do better but not all and not necessarily they will do better than in a sort of more neoliberal place like romania or or i don't know uh, slovakia right so this it, this doesn't mean that if you become more protective, that actually delivers better results. It's more complicated than that, right? And let me just say something. I mean, I, one of the things I really like, I really hate in the Western scholarship is they associate uh, Eastern Europe with like a some kind of exotic uh, nationalism. I mean, honestly, if you look today at the electoral map of Western Europe, the share of uh, of the far right vote is like in, in mass, you know, uh, Norway, Sweden, you name it, you know, um, France. I mean, the, in some cases, they will actually take over the government. Uh, whereas in, in Eastern Europe, that only only happened in, in Hungary and and uh, to some extent in Poland uh, with the so-called national national conservative governments who are actually national neoliberals at the end of the day. But everywhere else, it's, you know, pretty mainstream centrist parties in power i mean you really don't have unless in romania you have our come to power yeah i mean our is essentially about to take over france next year right so <laughs> with the last umbrella so it's i mean honestly if i were west european i wouldn't i wouldn't um sit in my chair passing judgment on uh the underdeveloped eastern europeans that's actually not the case I also think that this is um, a wider development, and not just the Eastern or Central European countries Absolutely. have to have to deal with a rise in nationalism. And I remember that um, the first time we talked in Contrasense about populism was for some years with Don Kalm. We yeah. made an episode with him, 
And I remember that talking with him made me somehow understand, but in the meantime, and reading your article, um, I'm asking myself again, what is the difference between just doing politics like a party and when you are a party which wants to govern or wants to get votes, you have to do certain certain decisions and certain measures. And what is the difference between just being a party and doing your a political party and doing your work and being a populist party? Because I think this is this is something what we have and what we don't really have uh, solutions against or ideas how to how to work against it. Well, I mean, I mean, I usually don't like to use the word populism uh, in a necessarily negative sense. I mean, there is a left people people think people usually when they say populism they mean European right wing populism, right or in this case, uh, it would be a form of right-wing authoritarianism that uses um, um, this language of the people versus the elites, right? I mean, this is the, the classical definition. But if you read the, the class, you know, Jan, uh, uh, you know, Müller and other, right? I mean, they, they say very clearly that um, um, populism... Uh, can be as a as a sort of as a as a technology of obtaining power rather than as an ideology, right? And I use it more into sort of a, a technology for obtaining power. Can be in, uh, deployed in a, in a in a sort of inclusive, emancipatory left wing direction. I mean, Bernie Sanders is a populist, and uh, you know parts of the of the European Socialist parties are populist in the way in the way they speak, but then. I, I want those people to be in power. And, and certainly US populism has moved the Democrats in a much more labor inclusive direction, much more than anybody would have thought of. The populists in Spain have moved the mainstream populists, mainstream socialist uh, party, who was basically a centrist uh, kind of liberal party, the, the so-called uh, socialist people's party, socialist workers party, into a more... Um, into like a party that rediscovered class politics and and you know like when they think about the the green transition they don't think about just green austerity right they think about kind of green investment by the state for real so in that sense um uh there is a book by Jorge Tamames on um it's very good on populism that I think kind of goes against this kind of use of populism uh, through a conflation with Orban style authoritarian capitalism, right? Um, and certainly in in unfortunately, in uh, our part of the world, and this is where, yeah, we kind of suck at that, right? I mean, the version of of um, populist technologies of taking power used to be neoliberal. I mean, just look at the at the political programs of Alianza da and you know, uh, to some extent, uh, this kind of like small ultra liberal parties. I mean, they are they are kind of libertarian or neoliberal populists in the sense that they create this kind of idealized people that are oppressed by government regulation and taxes versus um, versus the people who are unfairly persecuted, right? And therefore they want less government. Yeah, I mean, that's Trump, et cetera, right? Um, we don't have the, the version. Yeah, and then they mix it with, Technologies for taking power, such as in Romania, hating the Hungarians or the Roma. Yeah, in um, in Poland, it's about you know denying the role of Poland in the Holocaust and uh, you know the, the bad Germans, etc. Um, but the, the the bottom line being that um, in the East we don't have left populism as a serious contender to power, whereas we have a lot of left populism in the U.S. or we used to have it in the Labour Party, um, and I think this term has to be reappropriated um, in the sense that, at the end of the day, there is a world of economic elites that do tax dodging and they don't pay their fair share and they they uh, destroy the climate of the world, etc. Right? I mean, there is a world of these elites who don't care, right? And they're not and are empowered by a certain economic system that prevents them from being held accountable by societies. So that's real. I mean, it's not, a po it's not populism to say that this is, this is an empirical fact demonstrated, including by, you know, very mainstream economists. Yeah. Um, 
So I think there is a danger if we, because the, the problem is that if we use the word populism, then we kind of stigmatize uh, projects such as uh, those of um, those of um, um, of uh, Podemos in Spain, which has had extremely positive uh, minimum wage legislation and housing, etc., or those of Bernie. I mean, who are just basically saying and trying to promote. Uh, economic and social policies that mainstream centrist social democrats would propose in the 1960s but all of a sudden those became extreme and populist and i i argue against that i think i think this term doesn't really help us and i think it, it's it's a very imprecise term um because it's just steeped at this level of very shallow discourse. It doesn't tell me anything about the variation in the reality of policy and institutions and distribution that emerges, right, as a result of their intervention into the world. In fact, when these people come to power, I mean, look at our, if our comes to power in Romania, they are, what is our as an economic uh, project, right? It's a project that is going to put elements of neoliberalism on turbo. Yeah, they really will. They will do even more repression of the poor than the centrist parties are. They will make Romania poorer as a result because they will get into uh, trouble with uh, with the EU and they will lose their funds. And funds in uh, EU funds in Romania account for a very large proportion of the budget. We can't even pay for this budget. We already run on six percent deficit. Let alone without. I mean, basically, we would be uh, bankrupt every six months um, or something. So. I think we have to be careful and call our not a populist party, call them an authoritarian capitalist party, yeah, uh, with an ultra right uh, rejuvenation of uh, uh, of the worst uh, of Romanian um, of Romanian far right politics going back to the late nineteenth century, but particularly in the thirties, um, they do it in a sort of like more cleaned up version today. But effectively, that's what it does. They have absolutely no answer to Romania's. Uh, political economy uh, challenges. Um, they don't even have the kind of technocratic firepower that Orban has. I mean, at least at least Orban can claim that for 10 years he did deliver somehow to Hungary, although Hungary has underperformed compared to Romania in the last 10 years. But nevertheless, it, it's not a basket case. Hungary is not a basket case. They knew how to play it. Uh, these guys are the worst combination because they kind of take some tidbits from Orban and Poland, but without having the technocracy behind it. Let me tell you something. So in Poland, this kind of national conservative project, as they call it, is basically put into practice by the former CEOs of global multinational banks in Poland. I mean, those people know what they're doing. Now, compare those guys with George Simeon and the weirdos who run out. Yeah. I mean, this is what we are looking at. And there's, of course, one level is the variation between, say, you know, types of authoritarian uh, capitalist uh, parties. The other one is the level of in terms of their ideas. And then the other one is the level of um, of technical capacity of the elites of those parties. And our is the worst of all of them. It's both authoritarian and incompetent, right? I mean, you can get, you can get the incompetent fascists, right? <laughs> Who can do like massive damage. Um, so we do have a history of that. You can, we had the government like that in the in 1940s. So uh, I guess we can reinvent the game again. We will not be the yes. first, We're not very special. And that sounds also not like uh, uh, something uh, giving us uh, good perspectives for, for the future. I just wanted to um, translate the name of the, of the party you were mentioning in the, in the last minutes, because in, uh, the party is called Our in Romanian and in English, it sounds a little bit like our party. Uh, which yeah. is not uh, the name uh, in Romanian uh, means gold. I don't know how did how the they alliance for Romanian. unity of Romanians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, that's I mean, the whole not, name. They are close. They're pretty close to alternative for Deutschland. I mean, in terms of having both hardcore, um, super neoliberal pol policy instruments, right? Rejection of of the EU and the progressive uh, agenda. Sure, I mean, we have our own preferences, but this is assumed, yeah. Rejection of sort of the green, uh, uh, the green program and, and, and so on. And and a, a certain appeal to the working class, yeah, that doesn't feel institutionalized. And 
this part in Romania is very similar. It it does target a similar audience, but on top of it, it adds this kind of, I think particularly the petit bourgeoisie of the Romanian uh, development model that that feel kind of crowded out. Um, and um, I mean, in that sense, they're not that different from, from Germany because in Germany, the reaction is against immigrants. In Romania, the reaction, because we don't have a lot of immigrants, the reaction is against historical minorities that um, uh, have never been integrated by the Romanian conventional narrative into a positive story of the Romanian state, particularly the the symbolic exclusion of the Hungarians is outrageous. I mean, I, I, it, it is actually our feeds off of a certain mainstream historical account of, of the Romanian state that never, they always antagonized uh, symbolically the uh, absolutely fantastic role of that Hungarians have had in the development of Romania, but that's basically canceled by the mainstream narrative. So, so alternative food, uh, you cannot say that in the Federal Republic of Germany, that um, that IFD feeds off of a certain conventional mainstream historical account. In Romania, it does, actually. There isn't such a big difference between many historians in Academia Romana and uh, this new party. Yeah, I think uh, each country has its own uh, specific uh, weird nationalist or uh, fascist uh dreams which are uh, somewhere in some small rooms and uh, these parties manage somehow to i mean it's not accurate to call them fascists i mean they are authoritarian um capitalist parties uh, with a clear they have some elements of the kind of um hierarchy uh in society that the fascists have but they don't have this kind of Strong, strong anti-capitalist uh, dimension that um, that fascism, fascism had, uh, with its specific form of organization and cult of the leader. We don't really have that in the contemporary versions. I mean, you could use the term post-fascism that um, that uh, of course uh, the celebrated and unfortunately departed um, uh, during Mikhail Sta uh, Gaspar Mikhail Stamos has coined. Thank you for the for the remark. Um... Maria, would you like to? I was thinking no, because I, I was thinking we we use uh, we use so many terms, and you always try to be so specific about all, all the terms, which I noticed. And so I just I would just like to like if it's possible to shortly recap what what national neoliberalism means in Romania, because you you kept saying it it works in a certain way in Hungary that uh, it functioned and you analyze it there but what does it mean in Romania uh, it means uh, it means to an attempt to protect um, a um, an identified group of domestic uh, interests against foreign competition um, so um, in the case of Hungary uh, the point was to protect Hungarian uh, middle class and some straight out the working class yeah uh, against some of the side effects of financial uh, of globalized financial capitalism yeah especially through their mortgages um it was an attempt to uh, bolster and create a domestic entrepreneurial class right that was perceived to be elbowed out by european capital that had bought up much of the hungarian economy it means an attempt to um, finance the Hungarian state uh, by making foreign firms pay for it uh, through special taxes, um, through um, what I call financial repression, basically like forcing certain banks to uh, lend to the government at, at, um, at good interest rates. Um, uh, in exchange, of course, for some perks, the government would, would do them. Uh, it entails increasing the share of domestic ownership in banking. It entails um, increasing the share of domestic ownership in sectors that are not export sectors, because domestic capital is not very good at exporting from other countries. They're not sophisticated enough and don't have enough money. But it means bolstering the share of domestic capital in the domestic market. This is what it meant in Hungary. And probably if, uh, if uh, the, the Romanian version of national neoliberalism that was tried under um, under uh, the PSD and Dragnea um, was essentially explicitly trying to copy some of this. They just didn't know how to do it very well. Um, 
And I, I explained in my work uh, why they, they couldn't, because, you know, we don't have, uh, we have a state that is underfinanced, doesn't have uh, enough revenue. I mean, Hungarian state collects 38% of GDP. We collect 10% less than, I mean, we, we collect around 30, right? So we just don't have the money to run this game. Um, the Hungarian state essentially eliminated the independence of the National Bank of Hungary. In Romania, it's an independent institution. So you cannot force the banks to do some things if the central bank doesn't agree with you. Yeah, Because the central bank, if you don't have their cooperation, then you run into trouble when it comes to your own finances as a state. Yeah, um, And so on and so forth. I mean, these are this is what national neoliberalism means. It means that you admit that you are a small player in a global semi-periphery and you cannot play a purely protectionist nationalist game, right? You admit that. But you also know that there is enough room for maneuvering to protect domestic interests against international interests within that globalized structure. And when you do that, and this is the second part of the explanation, it doesn't mean that you become, you know, social welfare state, social democrat. No, you can do that using neoliberal instruments, right? Uh, so, for example, you can make the labor market even more liberal than it used to be, which is the case in Hungary. You can make, um, you can adopt tax policies that redistribute income uh, even more to the wealthier part of society than to the, you can punish the poor even more. I mean, if you're poor in Hungary today, you're worse off than you were uh, 15 years ago. So it doesn't mean that these are models of national solidarity. These are models that select certain economic interests that are defined to be national interests who are defended, but without destroying uh, so sort of the neoliberal legacy of the 90s and 2000s. That's what, I don't know if the definition makes sense. You were, you were telling now about the, the specificities, specificities in, the, in Hungary and in Romania. And uh, since we are also trying to reflect the, the work of, the, of this uh, prec work project you are also involved in, I wanted to ask you, how do you interpret the, um, or how do you um, make sense of the collected data about the reindustrialization in Bayamare, about the working conditions among uh, minorities or the housing struggles people have there in the, this bigger context you are talking about uh, uh, Romanian economy and this national uh, neoliberalism? I mean, it's fair to say that we uh, we are not national neoliberals. Um, we had an attempt for about two years during the Dragnea administration, and that failed. So we are just a, a boilerplate kind of uh, let's let's call it a globalist neoliberal project with a weak state, uh, and and uh, with a lot of hybrid. Uh, it's a hybrid mix of just really uh, aggressive libertarian agenda with some remainders of some kind of centrist social democratic uh, institutions, right? I mean, we're not, we're not exactly a playbook neoliberal country. Let's not delude ourselves, right? I mean, there are so many parts of the Romanian capitalist system that are not markets. They're basically organized as hierarchies. Um, you have insiders that rig those markets, um, that, that benefit from protection rackets. I mean, uh, by the metrics of a lot of what's going on um, in the ideal world of, um, of uh, say, neoliberal, neoliberal uh, policy uh, recommendations, we are not, we feel short of a lot of that, frankly, right? So, uh, Thank you very much for the question. I, I will give it a three-part answer, right? So there is a certain dynamic of, say, let's say, core European core, European semi-periphery. We're not periphery, we're semi-periphery. We export, if you, you know, peripheries export uh, primary goods, yeah? Uh, usually natural resources and and just pure, pure um, um, sort of basic labor, right? We're not, we're not that, actually. We have to be rigorous about it. Romania, Romania's export complexity, yeah, uh, is not all that different from that of many successful Northwest European countries. If you actually look at our export structure, right, 
and we're a pretty industrialized country uh, in that regard. Um, of course, of course, all of this takes place within complex value chains. So we assemble inputs from other places, but we also contribute. Um, we also contribute our own inputs uh, more than you, than we think. And that's let's say the sort of luminous side of Romania's development. I mean, Roma uh, when I started working in Romania twenty years ago, we would I I was much more pessimistic. I would I would have never thought we would be this good. Um, I expected we would be much something much closer to what's happening in say Georgia today or Armenia or uh, Peru, you know, um, Algeria. Um, not really not. I mean, Romania is much more developed uh, in its reality than in my hypothesis from twenty years ago. Um, and um, at, so there is a core periphery dimension to Bayamare. Uh, Bayamare is um, a part of Romania that is actually quite representative of the average Romanian uh, growth model, in the sense that it is uh, an export-oriented economy. Uh, the contribution of exports to growth in Bayamare over far outweighs that of the, of consumption. Um, uh, the value of exports has increased tremendously in the past 15 years. Actually, the last 10 years have been the best years ever since the 1960s and 70s for, for Bayamara in terms of industrial development. Uh, it is a place where, the, where the, the role of the domestic firms in the core peripheral relations is a very specific one. And it is based on predominantly... Um, low and average at best value added uh, products in uh, furniture, uh, some chemicals, and increasingly there are some niche sectors such as the air, airspace industry. Uh, there's a um, there's a factory that makes parts for, for aircraft, uh, which is, you know, the kind of direction in which you, you want to go. But in general, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, Aramis and, the, you know, it's it's furniture. I call Bayamare furniture central. I mean, it really is you know, Ikea and then uh, Italian, expensive Italian sofas, right? Um, so in that sense, I would say uh, if you take this export profile, it's not all that um, all that dissimilar from that of, say, parts of North Italy or, um, you know, uh, some more rural parts of Denmark. I mean, it's it's really not a particularly depressing uh, story in terms of, of, of that industrial... Um, dynamics. Now, uh, could it have been worse? Absolutely. Just look at Reshica. I mean, there's other parts of Romania that were as industrialized as Bayamare that imploded in the 90s and never recovered, right? We never recovered. Um, entire parts of Bulgaria never recovered from this. Parts of East Hungary, they now are recovering, but with some difficulty and with very exclusionary dynamics. So in theory, Bayamare would have enough resources to do much better in terms of how they treat uh, everyone, except it doesn't happen, right? So, so there is a sort of lazy, there's a sort of lazy leftist story about core periphery that says, oh, if you're a periphery or semi-periphery, it must be awful. It must be awful across the board. There is no agency. You you are screwed, yeah. And that's a lazy story because it doesn't explain variation. It doesn't explain why, in a country that has had some of the most spectacular growth rates. Uh, in the global semi-periphery, and Romania is one of them, let's face it. I mean, it does have a certain, just like you would talk about a nation country in the 90s, an East Asian country in the 90s, we can talk about Romania today. It's actually far uh, in excess of what's happening in many parts of the semi-periphery, from Turkey to Argentina to Brazil to others, right? Uh, including Southern Europe, yeah, including Greece. Um, but that doesn't explain why, despite all this, our levels of extreme poverty yeah, uh, and there is a, a specific set of metrics for extreme poverty, are more similar to places like uh, like Peru and Bolivia and and some African countries. I mean, the the uh, I wouldn't throw African countries in. We have, I have some specific um, I have some specific numbers on 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 the countries in question that I will get to later on, but but the level of of extreme poverty in income, um, life expectancy, health and habitation that I have witnessed in Bayamare cannot be explained by core peripheral relations by itself, right? Because there are, you know, I compare in my work, 
um, that's not published yet, Baia Mare with Bistitsa, which is where I'm from, right? Now, Bistitsa does not have that, but Bistitsa has, is even a little bit poorer than Baia Mare, has a very similar export-oriented uh, industrial model, but they are building uh, probably some of the, 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 probably the largest number of uh, decent social housing per capita in the country. Like you, do, you just do not have that extreme um, form of uh, penal, penal regime uh, that is applied to the, to, the, to the Roma, living right next to these export-oriented firms that are doing really well for IKEA and others. I mean, that just doesn't explain it, right? So I, as much as I am revolted yeah, by the, by the uh, degree to which um, uh, the degree to which the local business and uh, and state authorities and municipal authorities have been unable to take the reindustrialization in Bayamare and take it in a more high value added direction. I, I argue that it is as outrageous to reduce this to a story of corporate regulations because that denies agency to these people. And they do have this agency. The local municipality the local employment agency, the local uh, business have agency in not allowing this, um, this complete scandal to exist in Bayamara. But because it is not structurally demanded by that corporate relations. Indeed, right? If I were to argue from, let's say, the perspective of uh, just for a second, if I were to step in the business of the uh, business consultant, I would argue that it is against business interests to have people with such uh, poor levels of habitation and sanitation to be workers because the business needs productive workers. They don't need surplus population that uh, dies at, in their mid thirties and their children will you know, are contaminated by chemicals and have no access to a, a proper public uh, schooling. There, is, there are wonderful activists who provide some of it, right? But I mean, there is absolutely nothing in business interest to have the opposite of productivity, right? So, I mean, I'm not a business consultant, but if I were, I would say there's nothing inherent. It is actually against the interest of capitalist development of Biomare to have this, uh, this, um, level of 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 a, almost a penal colony that is taking place so just for 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 people who are not familiar with this i mean we're essentially looking at degrees of um of uh, social uh, and housing exclusion that go from people living in an abandoned factory uh with no heating and no uh, garbage collection to people who live in makeshift buildings that are bulldozed on a regular basis uh, next to the town's um, uh, garbage dump, which is also next to one of these IKEA exporting factories. I mean, that, that makes no sense from a structural standpoint, as evidenced by the fact that it is not a typical picture of exclusion in uh, the Northwest region. I mean, Zalo, which is a poorer place, doesn't have that. Bistitsa doesn't have that. Cluj, on the other hand, which is the country's most developed um, uh, software uh, sector, has one of them, right? So I, I, I argue that the social scientists, we should get serious and, and figure out how much, is, how much of this is a structural story that's wired from the structures of capitalist uh, corporate relations, and how much of that is actually domestic agency. And I, I would argue that there is a lot of, of domestic agency, um, sure. Core periphery would explain why we don't have, you know, the ample fiscal resources of the Danish state. Sure, I get that, right? In Slovakia, you will find similar communities that are excluded, um, Roma communities in this case as well, who live in sim similar levels of social exclusion um, and habitation uh, hell, essentially. Um, but um, Slovakia has more money than Romania. The Slovak state does have that. So there is a lot of conversation about race, conversation about kind of like historical exclusion of this community, even during communism. This is what some of the work packages bring out the fact that contrary to conventional um, wisdom, there were very clear practices of exclusion of the Roma and the sort of high ethnic hierarchy in who got jobs at what level, and that came to haunt people later on, right? Um, there, there we should have stories about um, the reorganization 
uh, and administration of the housing stock, which is something that Enrico and others do wonderfully, right? My job, I mean, I don't do housing, right? My, my job is to explain, is there an inherent demand from the growth model of Bayamare for this level of exclusion? And I, I, I argue, no, there isn't. Uh, this is actually counter, um, this is kind of, if I were to be vulgar here, I would say this is very anti-business to have these levels of, of persecution. It makes no sense. I suppose that it's just you no know, these typical discussions about there is not just capitalism or just racism or just homophobism yeah. or something. It's all very intersectional, and Romania has a very also a very complex history with complex problems, and the the racism Romania uh, has since ever doesn't really change or get better in, in some in some many perspectives so just as you say even though for capitalist reasons there is no no good point to have this this outrageous uh, situation it it still exists and there are still politicians in this in this city and in this region who get votes for it and who just continue to 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 uh, govern in this in this way and i'm asking myself what what is the what is the project project's contribution or the the aim of the project to in in in, um, in, in this direction uh, are you intending to give a kind of um, recommendation or some kind of uh, uh, just uh, uh, statistics to say, okay, this is the problem. I we don't know what sh what should be done, or is also the project aiming to to give some kind of policy, public policy recommendations? Yeah, it's both. I mean, we have a book um, under uh, it's not under contract, but Routledge University, uh, Routledge uh, Press, right, wants to um, is very interested in it, and and uh, that book. Uh, asks a simple question. Um, how can a European country that counts as a high-income country now by the IMF have a share of people in extreme poverty uh, as, as much poorer countries in the global south, right? So to, to be specific, between 2007-2020, uh, uh, ultra-poverty ranged between 7% and 2% in Romania, yeah? And um, Romania is at uh, $36,000 uh, per capita income per year in 2021. And this level makes the country comparable in terms of ultra poverty in regard to much poorer countries. So for example, Bolivia, right? Um, so Romania is $36,000 per capita per year. Bolivia is 8,800, right? And has comparable levels of, um, of ultra poverty. Ecuador, 11,000 in 21, much lower levels. Um, um, of um, of um, similar levels of ultra poverty. So um, what's more in most particularly interesting, so for somebody who doesn't care about Romania, right? Let's just forget this country. It's an interesting phenomenon that in a country that is successful and dynamic, yeah, and it's actually one of the most dynamic East European countries in the last 10 years, um, uh, that has essentially converged with Hungary and, and is uh, at Portuguese levels on adjusted income levels, if you look at uh, purchase power. Um, it, was, it is also the country with, uh, it's, it's one of the European countries with one of the highest increases in wages, okay, and including net wages, in which consumption and exports are clearly the result of a, an industrial success story, that you have this kind of that looks more like Bolivia and, and Peru and not like Europe uh, when it comes to extreme poverty. This is what we're trying, this is the broader phenomenon we're trying to explain that somebody from say, who's interested in Malaysia or Turkey or, or, um, or um, let's say an, um, an South Africa would like to understand or India, right? I mean, these are all, you know, India is also a spectacular success story, right? In many regards. And it has it. It's incredible technological developments cohabits with extreme uh, with extreme poverty. Um, uh, so the point is that this kind of idea of um, economic growth leaves any, leaves everybody up. Just not true, right? I mean, Romania is an extreme case of economic growth in in European semi-periphery. Has averted the fate of 
you know, uh, Greece and to some extent Bulgaria that lags far behind Romania on, on, on most metrics of development. And yet it has this extreme, uh, extreme poverty. So that's the first part of the answer. So we have a boot project uh, that has extremely uh, strong interest from Rablich. And then the second is, um, yeah, we do have a policy package. Each of the working packages come up with propositions that operate at the level of national government, um, regional authorities, um, because the development regions are the, are the basically level of authority in Romania that channels European funds. Yeah, and at the level of the municipality, of course. Yeah, um, and first, in my case, I also do some recommendations to the business sector because I'm, I teach in a business school, and I think it's just it it is just completely outrageous that large export-led firms in Biomare bus people from 60, 70 kilometers away, while 200 meters away from the factory, you have this shanty town um, growing that's bulldozed, and people are basically beaten by rats in the middle of winter um this is this is the level that's allowed um in that uh, in that kind of uh, in that kind of neighborhood so um so for these people they should definitely fund the housing program they should fund um uh, uh, health programs and and uh and skill training programs so that you essentially can have um let's say from a business perspective reproduce the human capital that you need at least but the, the problem with Biomara is that they don't even operate at this business level, right? They operate at the sort of, um, you know, ultra-racialized um, um, kind of punitive level. It, it, it just doesn't make uh, a business sense to allow this to happen there. Um, so, yeah, there is a very complex set of requirements that come from organization of labor market to housing, health, um, sort of business strategies uh, and involvement. It's not that we are very optimistic, but at least we'll have this proposal. I think the big actor that has been neglected in these policy recommendations before is the regional authority. I mean, Romania gets pretty massive European funds and a lot of them are tied up to social exclusion, right? And just a lot of the of the social exclusion programs are have not ben benefited this community. They've had good results in other parts of uh, the county. Um, there was some housing programs, some schooling programs in, in other parts of the Northwest region that have worked well. One of them is close to Bistrița, and it's a combination of national funds and European funds that has led to dramatically improved inclusion in the labor market and really good housing for Roma families that had been essentially thrown out of social housing in Bistrița. Um, but in other parts, the money had been spent on, uh, you know, ill-advised training programs that left no results and without serious sociological research. I mean, our if I were to take one single policy advice from our uh, research is to say, look, when you use European funds to target social programs, especially housing programs, make sure you use sociologists and ethnographers to get you the data and to get you the insights into what actually works there, as opposed to having some bureaucrat in in Biomare and just go from the helicopter and write something and then say, oh, based on best practices in Amsterdam and uh, Varna, we're going to do this in Biomare. That's a methodologically completely flawed approach. So our plea is to the regional authorities and to the county authorities to take social science expertise seriously and deploy it. You know, and this, what we do here is a sort of like controlled experiment of what the what kind of policy advice you get if you actually take sociology, anthropology, political economy seriously into a research team. And that's what they should have at the level of the um, regional authorities in Cluj that actually act as intermediaries for these EU funds. I think that's, if I were to take one single take-home lesson that should change the way they do business, it would be this. But it seems, so it seems to me that from what you've recently said is that in the case of Bayamare and maybe other cases, is that actually racism, it runs deeper than capitalist interests. Yes, it does. Absolutely, it does. So, so then you're... The capitalist interests, uh, let's say, uh, if capitalist interests would not be, uh, would not be embedded into racism, which they are in Bayamare, if they would be embedded into sort of a sense of into a sort of a wake up call that it's racism is self defeating, you would probably have a different outcome. Not because 
you should expect business to provide the housing, but business is an important lobby group and they could lobby authorities to think about how are we going to get our labor in 15 years, right? So why, why do we allow, allow ourselves to lock out of the labor market, which is very tight in Myanmar, extremely tight labor market, an entire generation of children that are growing in a cursed neighborhood, or actually set of neighborhoods, without electricity and plumbing and, and decent uh, nutrition. There is absolutely no way that the majority of these people can um, have fulfilled work lives in uh, Romanian capitalists. Absolutely no way. So yes, Maria, that's that's a good way to phrase it. Uh, it's also depressing that these are the players. I mean, we could have had better players, right? Um, Anti-capitalist right. power. And you do. I mean, look. Even of course, you can have, you can have. Uh, I don't know the government, let's say of Vienna, right? I mean, municipal government of Vienna is the world's most enlightened housing policy. I mean, we could have that, sure, but I don't see it coming out of Romanian politics. Uh, or by Amare, let alone by Amare politics. I mean, by Amare is at, at really the bottom of the sort of hopeful political spectrum um, in that regard. Um, but again, right, I mean, to deliver a basic uh, housing would be something that's achievable even within the very exclusionary uh, real existing Romanian capitalism, as evidenced by the fact that um, social housing has been addressed uh, on a pretty hopeful basis in places like Bistrița and others that are, you know, an hour and a half away and are the functional counterpart to Bayamare. So it is uh, eventually uh, a choice. Of course, the Roma in Bistrița are poor. They're poorer than the rest of the population, but they do not live in these conditions. We do not have uh, an urban ghetto of such uh, extreme intensity as the one we've seen there. And again, right, it's not about wealth. Cluj has one, like Bayamare. So it's not about being able to afford it or not being able to afford it. It's about, do you want to exercise a form of politics that makes this uh, unfathomable? Or do you, do you want to normalize it and make it part of your domestic color in political economy and municipal politics? I think we've been just just a few minutes before in a better place. <laughs> uh, what the the emotional uh, the emotional level of positivity in this in this discussion, but we missed it, so we have to finish it somehow. Uh, without, <laughs> yeah, I have a, a fun question for the end. But did did you want did you want to did you have something? No, okay. So uh, while you were talking, I I realized uh, that you're a good person to ask this because you have this really broad overview, and so maybe you have um, you have a, a view on this too. It's a bit of a challenge if you can uh, answer it uh, shortly because it's gonna be okay. two scenarios. So I'm I'm wondering I'm, I want to ask you what do you think are the best case scenario and the worst case scenario for Romania in the next 20 years in terms of political economy taking into account the lives of people and the the climate crisis the fi financial situation we are in the ecological destruction uh, the war everything that we are facing what is the the best case scenario and the worst case scenario start with the worst and with the best <laughs> maria if if my scenarios would have uh, any value uh, i would be a rentier capitalist uh, funding your show uh, but um, uh, take what i say with a great uh, with a lot with with 2 kilos of salt right so let me let me venture into this. So worst case scenario and short. Worst case scenario is that we have a demographic crisis compounded by anti-immigrant politics coming from um, from an authoritarian capitalist project taking over that ends up immiserating the country even further. The pension system collapses and we end up with a familiar su survival package in health, pensions, and unemployment which in turn leads to uh, losses in productivity and outflows of the existing uh, foreign capital in uh, manufacturing. Um, 
the country survives through a couple of niche sectors um, in Latin American style, say uh, parts of the IT sector that have what it takes to reproduce themselves and even do better over time. So we branch into the uh, AI revolution and quantum computing, but the rest of the country becomes more like the contrast between Bangalore and the rest of rural India. Um, so I don't think that we're going to implode, but we're going to have an incredibly coerced uh, uh, and narrow uh, development model in which we face the middle, this kind of like low higher income trap, uh, verging between uh, a bailout every 10 years, uh, a massive climate crisis without adaptation scenarios uh, in public policy, without the money uh, to fund for uh, adaptation to, to climate shocks. Uh, because as we grow now, we are not building the infrastructure in hospitals and cooling centers and proper retirement homes that will enable us to deal with heat waves and, and floods and so on. So I think that's probably the worst, the worst case scenario. I think the worst case scenario of the next 20 years is one in which we kind of get stuck and have much nastier, more repressive politics. I think that's what we're going for here. And potentially with a far right uh, instigated um, uh, conf conflict uh, with uh, with the national minorities in the country, and I'm I'm truly truly afraid of that because since these people don't have solutions, they're going to scapegoat the problems on the usual uh, usual suspects, the Hungarians and the Roma. And when the immigrants will inevitably um, uh, come in then we'll have a third dimension of bad politics, and that will be the anti-immigrant politics. So in, in other words, that's the worst of all, of all worlds, but it, it has to be, it's not Mad Max, right? I mean, it's um, it's something that can survive um, around the thin edge of, of bankruptcy and low wage growth for a long period of time, and in which a large part of the population doesn't benefit from, from the... Um, uh, let's say the bright spots of the economy. Okay. Now the brighter scenario, the brighter scenario is is that in which, and I I'm I don't know where I sit on this because sometimes I have, I, I I'm quite optimistic about what might happen. So a brighter scenario the is the most optimistic one. Go for that one. The most optimistic one, but it has to be realistically optimistic because otherwise it doesn't make sense, right? So realistically optimistic is that um, as a result of. Um, of a major fiscal crisis of the state in which we just don't collect enough tax taxes to pay for the current spending, um, we have, a, a for the first time, a reorganization of uh, the way we collect taxes from, from the private economy, right? And as a result of that, we have enough fiscal space to then uh, boost um, uh, good spending on health, education, housing, anti-poverty uh, programs. That in a generation will result into a population with far improved uh, uh, skills and health and housing conditions that translates into higher productivity, which if I'm guessing your question refers to a future that is still uh, capitalist, because I do not dare to think beyond that. Uh, I don't think anybody has what it takes for that, we don't, which I don't, I don't see the political and the structural forces that will take us there then we'll have the space to better deal with the climate crisis as well. So it will be a country that would be closer to, say, Slovenia, right? I mean, that's my realistically best expectation. We don't grow like crazy, like now, but we have a more balanced, uh, more egalitarian society with, with better prospects to reproduce uh, virtuous circles. Uh, on the climate front, which is the one I'm really the most afraid of, um, I mean, our export sector is, of course, uh, very heavily geared around the uh, internal combustion engine in, in Germany. And that model is called, uh, called out now by uh, the, the green transition. And then if Germany survives, right, and this is part of my bright scenario, if the German growth model survives and, and, and we benefit from it, then... Um, there could be some virtual circles be between decarbonization and our manufacturing sector, right? In which case, we will have revenue to actually build the climate adaptation infrastructure that we need. Because the, the decarbonization is something that I'm taking for granted. I mean, we have to do that. We absolutely have to put 
wind power into the Black Sea and completely get rid of coal and have in my in my book a combination of nuclear and renewables to have um to have a decarbonization of energy sector and cement and phosphates, which are the biggest contributors to emissions. But most importantly, is the infrastructure of adaptation because the climate change also comes from other countries. We will face heat waves and um, extreme levels of heating, and we're not prepared for that. We just have no thinking done into it. We're, to the extent that we do anything, we are being forced by the EU funds. But there's no sense of panic among authorities. This is real. So I think that the combination between a fiscal crisis and, and, and the first painful consequences of the climate crisis potentially can lead to the emergence of uh, a political electoral coalition that will create demand for more sane policies in the in the state so the state will appreciate you know quality public housing that's you know cooled and heated using uh, affordable and renewable energies uh, a state that appreciates um, reproducing um, a, a healthy um, uh, advanced literate population that has decent commutes rather than hellish commutes a country in which um, uh, progressively, a lot of the things that destroy us, you know, say financialization of housing or marketization of education and health, stops all of that, right? And translates them back into rights rather than market assets and instruments. Um, this is the kind of sort of realistic, let's, let's call it a certain version of 21st century uh green uh, social democracy for lack of a better term right um but without the downsides of nationalist social democracy that we had and it, it is a country that i mean all of this is going to be impossible without 15 20 percent foreign-born population settling in romania and putting roots here and being accepted as uh parts of the political body and parts of the social body and, you know, I mean, here, this is where I have both reasons to despair and reasons to be optimistic, because um, um, I have reasons to, to despair because the way in which uh, Romania has treated Hungarians in the last 100 years has been awful. Um, and so we don't have a good track record. The way in which we have treated the Roma and the Saxons has been awful, although they are all historical minorities. But at the same time, we do have a history of, let alone the the Jewish, pop, the the our our the Jewish Romanians who are completely uh, they were subject to extreme persecution. Uh, but at the same time, there are examples of integrating Armenians and Turks and Bulgarians and Serbs, right? I mean, there there are there is you know and Italians. I mean, this is a very multi ethnic country that has been in denial about its core multi ethnic identity, and instead has come up with some historical uh mythology about uh ethnic romanians right um when we do that i think we have a shot at being this like really like wonderful multi-ethnic country that can survive the climate crisis and the the uh vagaries of real cap real existing capitalism right i mean that's that's the the kind of optimistic uh realistic scenario you know what would be my uh my sort of normative uh, standing point, take your peak. I mean, I'm, as you know, my politics are quite on the left. So I would definitely prefer something that is uh, much more emancipating than this. Uh, and, and and clearly I will become an enemy of, um, of the nationalist, uh, uh, neoliberal, nationalist, uh, anti-neoliberal varieties of politics that are uh, abundant in our country as well as in others. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope that uh, not just you, but many, many of us uh, living or having to do with Romania will also get enemies of uh, this uh, authoritarian uh, um, already are the enemies of this thing. We just have to embrace that. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, we, have to, we have to embrace that there are, we have skin in the game and we have to pay uh, a price. I mean, we have to. Uh, there's no such thing as, you know, consensual um uh, role playing you know in this emerging political universe of europe i mean i mean one of the most depressing things here right is that and this is a new theory that i've seen emerging in european studies is that because europe has failed to be the kind of 
social Europe that it kind of seemed to have been promised in the late 80s. Now we're kind of like turning and we become this kind of like white regional project, right? That in which being European, as in like white European, matters more than being European uh, and being social and kind of drawing on the more luminous kind of decolonial part of Europe, uh, trad tradition of Europe, which goes back to the Enlightenment. I mean, when my our, my friend Veronica Lazar has this wonderful uh, exploration of how the European Enlightenment wasn't just about enabling uh, empire. It also was uh, a reflexive. It, it had this kind of strands that were very emancipatory and very cosmopolitan and embracing without necessarily becoming a legitimation device for white Europe or something, you know? So I think there are a lot of people kind of drawing on that today. And I hope that their politics will be the ones that will prevail. Because if not, then we're definitely going to live in a sort of post-fascist capitalist uh, uh, universe in which the climate crisis will deepen the authoritarianism that is apparent in, in many uh, corners of European politics today, because it will be about, you know, policing the borders against climate refugees. And that's what, uh, what Europe might be reduced to. And that's just a nightmare that we have the obligation to resist to. And if we, if we fail, at least we have put up a fight. Yeah, this, this is nice to, I think this is nice to hear. And I would like also to to uh, finalize our discussion with it, that there is this option to fight for, to fight for something which is m m desirable and better and that we 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 must put our our energy and our work in in this in this uh, direction and this fight to to make our our societies uh, somehow uh, yeah a future nice apartments um uh in a cooler climate with great culture that is available to all and in which you don't have to uh worry about being attached to some kind of um uh, machine for your survival, right? This is, I think, what we're all going for. But thank you guys so much. This is very stimulating. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for for the discussion and for the uh, good um, explanations and overviews out of uh, uh, on on the subject. Thank you for listening to Contrasense podcast. Our guest today was Cornel Ban. This episode is a collaboration with the Prequark project from Babish Boya University. Prequark work is a precarious work on peripheral housing, the socio-economic practices of the Roma in Romania in the context of industrial relations and unequal territorial development. I hope you enjoyed this topic and our discussion. And if you are curious about more, follow the internet page of the project that we'll post in the description. It was a big pleasure to discuss this topic with Cornel. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Music is by Kind Studios. You can find out more about Contrasense on our Facebook page. You can also listen to other episodes of our podcast on SoundCloud and everywhere where podcasts are. Let us know your thoughts or curiosities at our email address, contrasense at protonmail.com. Hear you soon. Stay close and until next time.